everybody. I'm Barry Steigers with K-High Morning News. Also, your host here on the Auburn News 20. Well, this was another year of the Tevis Cup. We're famous for that. We're known all over the world for it, as a matter of fact. 2013 marked the 58th running of the Western States Endurance Ride, in which horse and riders compete with each other for the Tevis Cup and for the Hagen Cup. The first horse to cross the finish line wins the Tevis Cup. And the Hagen Cup is then awarded to whichever of the top 10 finishers is deemed in the best condition. Starting in Squaw Valley and then ending at the Auburn Fairgrounds, the 100 mile Western States Trail considered the toughest in the world. People come from all over the world to compete in this prestigious race. This year, an extremely hot year, temperatures above 103, the thunderheads in the mountains creating high humidity and even more challenging for both horse and rider. Paula Johnson and the ACTV news crew was there, and now here is that report. Riding on the Western Stage Trail is an experience that will always remain vivid in my mind. The challenge of watching where you are going to be prepared for any eventuality at any moment is demanding. But the captivating scenery kept my mind occupied, trying to absorb everything. The fresh scent of springtime was in the air, and there were still patches of snow and sparkling creeks for the horses to take a sip of pure mountain spring water. You can't take your eyes off the ground for long though, as your horse deftly picks his way through broken chunks of granite. This area, known as the Granite Chief Wilderness, is the area through which the horses usually have to wade through deep bogs. Fortunately for my ride, this was a dry year, and the bogs were minimal. There is always a fear of losing a shoe from the suction. I was here about a week before the race with a trail-clearing crew. These plucky women, led by Phyllis Keller, and including Vicki Testa and Laura Duncan, regularly romp around these mountain trails, keeping things safe as possible. I'm Phyllis Keller. Hi, Phyllis. I live in Truckee, and, and you I'm on the Western States Trail Committee, and I try to keep okay. the eastern yeah, side yeah. of the wilderness, the wilderness to all the way to Roby Park, Are clear. That seems like quite a project, and how many miles is that? Uh, let's see. High camp is 13, uh, to this one, 13, 17, probably about 20 miles, just, yeah, about 20 miles, I guess. And do you ride the Tevis yourself? I try, I try, I try. Do you? Good for you. <laughs> not so, this year. No, this year not this year. I'll be uh, working at uh, Red Star Ridge. Okay. And then I travel down to Francisco's for night. Okay. And yeah. then I'll go on over to the stadium probably about 2.30 in the morning mm -hmm. and wait for friends. And then I get in the truck, back of my truck at about maybe 6 o'clock and I have <laughs> about an hour and a half of sleep. And then I go have breakfast with everyone. Wow. It's a long day. I'll be going in on Friday afternoon. I'll be up for about 36 hours. Wow. The you are not 62. I am. I'm zooming in on your face. There's no way. There's no way. <laughs> yes. I don't believe it. She's My fibbing, right? My little cupcake and I hope to do something someday. Well, here is an example of how to stay looking fabulous. You just go out riding your horse on the trail. Yes, it's good for the soul. In the Sierra Nevada. Yeah, most beautiful place. Isn't it incredible? And have you ridden it in the, in the Tevis? Vicky's a champion. Yeah, I've done it six times. Okay, let's hear your story. What inspired you? How did you first find out about it? I found out from a gal that was talking about it in Santa Cruz. Oh, yeah? And uh, she said, yeah, and at the end you have to cross the river. And I said, ah, I'll never do that. I don't swim. <laughs> <laughs> and then I moved up here and I got the fever and I did it. Oh, fantastic. And the river wasn't a problem. We didn't have to swim. <laughs> That's really great. Mostly I took photos and video while the others wielded trimmers lopping off overhanging branches and shrubbery so that the horses could at least see the trail. This is tough going. <laughs> it's 
So this horse steers himself. Although I was riding an experienced horse, I found out that this is no easy task, is, yeah, and I was limping along by the end of it. But I would not have missed the opportunity for anything. I'm ready to try again next year, but I will be better prepared. It was interesting to listen to the stories of these veterans of the ride. And I hear the bear, but I never see them. Hmm. And, you know, I just respect the we fact I'm in their, their house. Poop. Yeah, we oh, see, yeah, about we see yeah. miles. And we hear, but we don't really see them much. Yeah, I, yeah. But on Tevis one year, I did see a bear. Did you? I was running up front. That's one of the treats of seeing a bear. Ah. And the bear ran in front of us for quite a ways before he went off. Before he peeled off. Yeah. Wow. On race day, my photographer and I caught the first horses to come through Robinson Flat at nine-ish in the morning. It was already getting warm, but the horses all looked fabulous. Here we were seeing them in and out of the first vet check. Am I good? Uh, Hi. You got the range, 30 seconds. <clears throat> Go like the wind, okay? But not in the wrong place. That's right. Only when you're allowed to. Usually the only sounds in this forest are birds and insects, but today the forest was alive with activity. Crew members and general volunteers provide much needed support as they treat the hot competitors to a cool sponge bath or massage the aching muscles of both horses and riders. Most riders depend upon their crew members for sustenance and encouragement but some and hardy and courageous folk huh? brave the elements all alone. Suzanne Hedgecock, riding her horse, Julio's Last Chance, was one example of such an intrepid soul. There goes Rusty Toth, riding Take a Break, a.k.a. Quake. <laughs> These two ultimately won the Tevis Cup. Close behind were Suzanne and Julio, who went home with the revered Hagging Cup, awarded to the top 10 finisher whose horse is considered in the best condition. Just got told she had to wait 14 minutes before heading out. He seems to love this. Though. Really? Interesting. Fantastic. Really good good, good luck. Right. We need an official spokesman. No, you don't. Hi. What happens here? This is the uh, official out timing disc. Uh -huh. And here at Robinson Flat, the horses come in. Um, they've done approximately 30 miles, give or take. They have a one hour mandatory stop here. And when they've gone to the vet, the vets have checked them for pulse and respiration criteria and also soundness criteria. And they have a card that gives their um, pulse in time. When they meet pulse and respiration criteria, their hour starts. So. They come up, the horses then, after they sit for the hour, they come up here to the out timer and we make sure that the time in their card um, is the hour and then we let them go on the hour to go forward down towards Auburn. I see. That's our function here. Okay, great. All and right. it looks like you've done this a few times. Yes. How many times? Enough. Too many to count. The awards <laughs> banquet is an opportunity for past alumni of the race to get together and reminisce and share their awe for these amazing athletes and for recognizing the many volunteers who devote countless hours to the success of the race. So Bailey, where are you? Come on up here. She's only been working on this ride for 50 years, that's why she's slow getting up here. Uh, Ro started, uh, she was um, hired by uh, Wendell Roby as a uh, ride secretary. She's done endurance rides for many, many, many years. If you ever saw her ride, you could spot her riding ability. She's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful rider. Uh, I'll go back to a story. I was riding the Drake's Bay ride, and I hadn't seen Ro for maybe five or six years. And I saw this horse and rider go across the beach. And I go, damn, that's Ro Bailey. Somebody says, how do you know that? Because it's just the way she rides. Very, very pretty rider. Um, she's a 
past Board of Governors. It has four tennis buckles, is that right, Bill? In 69, 72, 74, and 75, she really likes my husband. <laughs> so he really should be presenting this to her. Yes, yes, that's, that's all I've ever heard for 30 years. How's Ernie? Well, I'm fine, Ro. How in the heck are you? you know, that's, that's Ro Bailey at her finest. She's been a part of SOS. How many years, Ro? Which is? Oh, I never mind, you're old. That's all right. And, and I heard that one time you put a helmet on with a radio antenna on it from you coming out of uh, Roby Park. Is that where you were starting from? And you were riding your husband's ass? <laughs> That's Ro Bailey at her finest. So Ro, thank you for all your wonderful dedication to the Western States Trail Foundation, uh, the Tevis Forum, and being my very good friend and Ernie's too. Okay, thanks. It's been a long, hard ride. I moved here in 1970. I got involved with Tevis in 1960. It changed my life. It made me who I am, for the good or the bad. <laughs> But I love it. It's a passion. I will live it all my life. City and county political representatives support and promote the entire effort of the Western States Trail Foundation and the designation, the endurance capital of the world. Mayor Henley. Thanks, Tom, and uh, on behalf of the Auburn City Council, we'd like to offer our congratulations to all the riders and volunteers. It was an awesome ride. Uh, yesterday, I was watching from the Forest Hill staging area, and it was re really a thing of beauty to watch all the volunteers and the veterinarians, the riders and the horses come in at, at Forest Hill, so it was quite gratifying. Uh, just a couple of points here. Several weeks ago, the Auburn City Council uh, lended its support on a 5-0 vote to make the Western States Trail a national, historic trail. And there's so much history in this trail from the Native Americans to the connection between the gold fields of California to the Comstock Lode in Nevada uh, to the registration of historical places at the Mountain Quarries Bridge, uh, Last Chance to Michigan Bluff. There's so much history that the Western States Trail deserves to be recognized by the U.S. Congress as a national historic trail. And I think this trail should definitely join the Lewis and Clark Trail, the Mormon Pioneer Trail, the Oregon Trail. The Western States certainly uh, deserves that designation. And we as the City Council supported uh, moving it forward at the federal level because we believe that it will help all of you raise funds to provide more access to people to events uh, on the western states trail so uh, we believe it's an excellent move forward and we're also going to as a city council support your efforts at the auburn staging area the finish line to do your wall of honor to recognize the history of this great ride uh, as we have in Central Square. As the endurance capital of the world, we uh, take great pleasure in both the Western States Run and the Tevis Cup. So I, I'm going to offer a uh, mayor's commendation to Kathy. And this is from the City Council. And it recognizes, you know, the wonderful bet that uh, Wendell Roby made in 1955 to. Uh, prove that today's riders and horses can have as much endurance as the pioneers. It was a great bet. And this is the premier ride in the entire world. And also, 
we wanted to recognize the dedication of all the volunteers and the veterinarians and the riders and the horses to make this amazing ride come true. So on behalf of the Auburn City Council, we offer our congratulations for the 58th Tennis Cup ride. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Hanley. I'd now like to introduce Placer County Supervisor Jennifer Montgomery. Jennifer is the supervisor for the 5th District. 90% of the trail is in her jurisdiction. She is an ardent supporter of the Western States Trail Foundation, and many of you that rode might have seen her yesterday at high camp. She's volunteered for many years. Jennifer? and thank you all for inviting me to speak today. Um, while I am not personally a writer, um, it's a pleasure to be among so many kindred spirits. I, I truly share your love for the trail, for the mountains, and for the ride itself. And it is really honestly a blessing for me every year to be able to participate as a volunteer. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart for letting me be part of this. Um, Many of you probably don't know, but Placer County was incorporated in 1851. The Tevis Ride has been around for 58 years at that time. So over a third of the history of our county has been involved with and associated with the Tevis Ride. And it's one of the premier events in the world. It's the original endurance ride, as many of you know. And uh, it is an incredible economic driver and an asset for the County of Placer. So just personally and as a, a political representative for the County of Placer, County of Placer, if I can say that, um, I, I thank you all because this is an incredible event for you, for our county, for our state, and just for our reputation worldwide. So again, uh, my thanks to you, and as long as I remain your representative, my staunch support for this event and the trail itself will continue. Um, similar to Mayor Hanley, um, on Tuesday I'm bringing a letter of support to the County Board of Supervisors at our next Board of Supervisors meeting in Tahoe um, to ask our federal representatives to uh, back the historic trail designation. It is really critically important for the protection of this trail and the continuation of this historic event. Uh, additionally, as the representative who, who uh, has, uh, actually probably, I hate to disagree with Tom, but probably more than 90% of the trail is within the 5th District, um, I'm continuing to work with the Western States Trail Foundation uh, for uh, new staging areas along the length of the trail. Right now it's pretty much just accessible, as you know, from the far western end and the far eastern end. We need to change that. We need to make sure that we have additional staging areas for the equestrian community, and I'm working hand in hand to help do that. Also working at the county level to make sure that we bring in some new public and private partners in this event and in support of the trail. On the east end of the county, I live on Donner Summit, and I, I will tell you, 58 years, and there are people who have absolutely no idea that this event goes through our community. And so, I'm working with North Star, Squaw Valley, the North Lake Tahoe Resort Association to try to get additional recognition and support in the far east end of the county because we need to make this work. We need to make it work for all of us if we want our children and our grandchildren to be able to participate in this event. And it's my commitment to you that that's what I'm here for, to help you do that, to make sure that this continues for at least another 58 years and into the future. Usually when politicians like me stand up here, we say really nice things about ourselves, but I actually want to take this opportunity to thank the Western States Trail Foundation. Um, recently, the Truckee Donor Land Trust out of Truckee uh, acquired 3,500 acres on Donner Summit. And as part of that acquisition, they are opening up formerly closed lands to the equestrian community. And the, um, the Western States Trail Foundation 
helped in that acquisition, both financially, they're helping in the planning and the development of how we use that property. Uh, stay tuned. It's going to be just an incredible asset for all of us, and I welcome you to come up and use the trails. They're open now in Soda Springs on Donner Summit, so get up there and use the trails. Bring water. It's a dry summer. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so, so as I said, you know, this acquisition will open almost 3,500 acres of formerly closed land to the equestrian community, among others. This is really going to be a win-win. And, and the real benefit of this is many of you will recall in 1983, we were unable to go over Squaw Valley because of the snow. The acquisition of this land offers the opportunity in the future for, for a staging area on Donner Summit in case we can't go out of Roby Park and over Squaw Valley, but it would allow us to continue to run the Tevis Cup traditionally out of the Donner Summit Soda Springs area. So I, I think it's really an incredible asset. Um, I would ask you all, if you have not already, there is a website that says, um, I believe it's called the um, royalgorgefuture.com, or .org, I'm sorry, and you can go on there and add your input to how you want to see this area used, how you see the, want to see these lands and these trails used. It's important that the equestrian community's voice is heard in that, so please make sure you do that. Again, it's royalgorgefuture.com, .org. Sorry. Um, but um, also just want to wrap up by saying thanks to everyone at the Western States Trail Foundation. Thanks to all the riders, the crew, uh, the mounts who often go unthanked, but without them, none of us would be here. And again, absolute true delight. So look forward to seeing all of you next year and more. The event attracts international attention and is good for the local economy. Next to me is a Tevis competitor. What's your name? My name's Rose Ross and I'm from Australia. Well, I was going to say, you don't sound like you're from these parts. No, no, no. I've um, yeah, come over here to listen to your lingo and uh, ride your beautiful course. You've come an awful long way to do this. What made you decide to take this on? Um, it's been in my bucket list for probably 30 years and I thought... You know, I've got to do it because, you know, one day they might close the trail and that'll be the end of it. And so I've been here just on a month now, conditioning myself. I've been out in Utah in the heat, riding the horses in the middle of the day. It's been 110 degrees and hydrating myself and getting to know the horse. And anyway, so, yeah, we turned up on Tuesday and, you know, this is amazing country and it has to be one of the most unique endurance rides, we call them in Australia, yeah. they call them a race here, yeah. rides here anywhere in the world. It is just amazing, Thanks. absolutely. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought that Lozzie came all this way and I was 11th, I just picked by the post for the 10th to be in the top 10, but crikey me, you know, this is... You're very, very lucky, all you Americans, to have such a beautiful trail, so much history, and, you know, to maintain and keep the trail open and stop the greenies from closing it. You know, keep working it because, you know, you are so lucky. And I'd just like to thank Christoph and Diane, Carla and Rhea, Doug and Nicole, and my mother gave me a surprise visit when she turned up you know, the afternoon before the ride started from Australia, you know. Just dropped in to say good day. <laughs> anyway, I'd just like to thank all the volunteers and all the organisers. You know, your job well good done, day, keep it up. And uh, I can't really say come to Australia and ride a course like that because we just, we can't put something on like that. Just congratulations. I have a couple questions for you. Do you have mountains like that in Australia? Oh, they try and call them mountains, but they're only little ant holes, really. <laughs> Do you have canyons like that in Australia? No. no. <laughs> but you have red dirt like that in Australia? <laughs> Plenty of. Thank you for coming all this way. Yeah! It was really good. And I said, Sue, you know, you can show this horse the best. And she said, and she came here all by myself. I don't have a crew. I can't stay up all night wow. and tend this horse and walk him. And I said, yeah, but this horse is really in great shape and you really ought to 
and I don't know how she did it, but she did it. And uh, Sue, I told you so. What do you get to say now? Where are we going? Disneyland! I want to thank, uh, first of all, my husband for sticking around for the last two years. He's had some health issues. Um, I don't know what I'm doing here, really, but my horse is ready, and I want to thank all the volunteers. Heck of a ride. Sue, Julio knows what to do. Sue Basham, who got me here, Tara Rothwell and her crew, and everybody else that helped me, because I'm lucky to be here. I love this opportunity. Competitors, too. Congratulations. It's a fabulous achievement. Second place, Jennifer Waite remembers how it was the night that she and her friend Jennifer Smith were ahead in the race when out of the moonlight came Rusty riding Quake. Uh, my riding partner and I, Jenny Smith, who finished third, we were um, heading home in first and second place uh, on the road coming up to Highway 49, and something blew by. <laughs> What was that? It like it split hairs. And we were like, Did you see anything? We felt this breeze up the back of our neck. It was rusty. <laughs> Congratulations, Rusty. Anyway, had a great ride. Uh, couldn't have been better. Ride of a life, um, particularly with my horse here, Zoe. Um, I bred her, raised her, have had nine years of blood, sweat, and tears with her, and um, she, she was all in yesterday. I couldn't be prouder. Thank you. Riding a horse called Take a Break. And Rusty would like to let you know that everybody gets his name wrong, just like everybody gets Chuck Scally's name wrong. It's Toth, like toast. And the way you can remember that is because if you're competing against them, you're toast. Well, Rusty Toth, I uh, got so excited last year when you won some awards here, I forgot to give you all your hardware. So they said, that's, that's right. So along with the first place buckle, you get a medallion as a keepsake, and a medallion goes on the Tevis Cup. Congratulations on an excellent ride. Tell us something about your horse, and tell us something about your ride. Uh, well, about my ride, it really wouldn't have happened without the team, and that team extends all the way through to the volunteers. But my crew, uh, we, we couldn't have done it without them. They're amazing, and I feel honored and fortunate to have such amazing friends to show up here and, and spend all day schlepping ice around for us. <laughs> And my ride, this horse, you know, I came here wanting to do well, I won't buy it. And um, with the heat and humidity, I'd kind of given up on it. And then I caught the poor Jennifer who said, Lord for it. <laughs> but this horse has got the most amazing canter. And uh, I knew it was almost over, so I dropped the reins and let him go. That's pretty much what we did the rest of the way. <laughs> It was an amazing ride, and I'm very thankful to have this amazing ride. Thank you. Congratulations. Well done.
the California State Fair is on. It's been a lot of fun. I took the cameras and went there for the first day. First, with the Placer County presentation. We're proud of that presentation because every year we get awards. This year, we got the Gold Award again, and we got two technical awards. Here is that report. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Barry Steigers with uh, Auburn News 20. We're at the State Fair, it's opening day. Lots of people here, and the parking lots are full. And people are going now through these two buildings, which is building B and C. This is where we have, the Placer County has its big exhibit. Each year we have an exhibit here, and it's always very popular, and it's also a prize winner. We're usually number one in one or two categories. This is all brand new this year, and it does highlight all the things that go on in Placer County, whether it's winemaking, whether it's hiking, whether it's boating, whether it's just having a good time riding a horse or a bicycle. Placer County is well known for mandarin oranges and, of course, for the fine wines. So if you have time, be sure you get to the California State Fair and be sure to come over and visit the Placer County Fair exhibit. It's really nice this year, but it is every year. I'm Barry Steigers for Auburn News 20. One of the great features of the fair is the music. There is a thing called the brews and the blues. And our own local Mick Martin and his band was there, and I was too. Well, I can't do it by myself. took the cameras, went on the tram, went all the way around the park, and then I visited all of the exhibits all in one day. And here is my day at the fair.
The USDA Forest Service, in partnership with the California Conservation Corps, is conducting the Veterans Green Corps. This is with wildland firefighters training in the Placer Work Center. This all happened last week in Auburn, California. The program will train 50 of the most recently separated military veterans to become wildland firefighters for us for a variety of federal land management agencies, including the Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, as well as other federal and state land management agencies. Paula Johnson went along to see what this is all about, and now here is her report. Last week, the United States Department of Agriculture Forest Service, in partnership with the California Conservation Corps, conducted the Veterans Green Corps Wildland Firefighter Training at the Plaza Work Center in Auburn, California. On Wednesday, July 10th, an ACTV camera crew went along to find out what it all entailed. The temperatures were about 100 degrees and the heat was intense. Hi, I'm Paula Johnston with Auburn News 20, and standing with me here today is... Brian Combs, engine captain off the uh, Mendocino National Forest, and we're here with the engine crew, uh, with, with the crews here, the, the veteran crews here, trying to teach them a little bit about hose lays and Type 3 engines and what we do uh, with, the, with hose and, and how to run the hose out and spray. So there's a lot more to it than meets the eye, is there? There is a lot more to it than meets the eye. Uh, there's little tricks of the trade that you get. And how's this training going so far? Are you impressed with the group of people that you have? Uh, I have been impressed. Uh, you know, they're, they're eager to learn. Sure that the fire is out. Also, cold trailing a fire can be when you, when you think you mopped it up and you completely mopped it up, it might be getting down on your hands and knees, right? And feeling around on your hands and knees. I spent Lots of time fighting fire on my hands and knees and right and you're gonna end up walking up and down steep hills with your fire line gear on and that back pump on. And I don't think there's there's a, such a thing as a, a back pump that does not leak. <laughs> so you're gonna end up wet, you know? Oh well. Yeah, we still got everybody, some more wood in here. Everybody grab everybody a chunk of wood and put wood. it out. Make sure you're not get the leaves and the stuff that's going to burn out of the way before you remove your piece of wood. Make sure you're not See, grabbing any black. Look what you're doing here. There. See that right there? Okay, hold on. See that black right here. that you're moving into the green here? You want to make sure you do not do that. The black stays in the black and the green stays in the green. This program was training 50 recently separated military veterans to become wildland firefighters for a variety of federal land management agencies, including the Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, as well as other federal and state land management agencies. Good, once you think that, that's good, Shepard? Right, there's a term out there called potato patching. I didn't know about this term until just a few years ago when I was working with a, a crew out of Tahoe. And potato patching is if you have a, a small fire, maybe you have a spot fire, you potato patch it. What do you think I mean when I'm saying potato patching? Every piece of dirt on that ground, you stir. You stir it up. You potato patch it. And you make sure, that way you make sure it's completely out. And as you're potato patching, if you have water, you squirt as I'm potato patching. See? And then right there, when it steams up, what does that tell you? There's, uh, there's heat right there. It's not out, is it? So let's better get that area. Okay? I don't need to do this. <laughs> I don't mind mopping up. That's part of my job all the time. When you jump a fire 15 miles off the road, you're it. And so you're not only the IA phase, the glory phase, 
you are the mop up and the crawl through phase, and actually that's one of my favorite things. I like it. It's fun. Big pride in it. It's a zen activity. In firefighting, there's probably fun. ten percent of glory. You think there's ten percent of glory out there, man? The other ninety percent is hot, dirty, physical work in extreme hot conditions. I was impressed to see women out here training to do this extreme job and asked the captain how females held up under the demands of the work. I would say just the same as the men in the sense that if they don't handle it, they don't last long. You know, and that's, that goes for everybody. I don't, I don't think you break it down by sex so much as by you know work ethic and heart. And so. People that aren't cut out for it usually figure it out quick and, and, and usually find their own way out. And what's really exciting for me here is uh, I have two people that are actually leading these crews that came from this same program wow, in April. Cool. Are they here now? They're here now, and they're actually kind of leading the crews. I'm letting them kind of lead the crews and teach the crews on how to do this stuff. So, uh, they're proving that they learned something. They are proving that they learned something from here, so that's a, an exciting thing for me to see. And, uh, Very gratifying. Yeah. I am living proof that the seas work <laughs> for you. <laughs> I was here in April um, doing this exact same stuff that you're doing. Everybody here military, prior military? Oh, yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, I did four years active duty. I'm in the National Guard right now, uh, almost seven years. In August, it'll be seven years. Um, and I can, I can honestly, like I said, this is living proof. I can honestly tell you that this is good. Where are you guys from? San Bernardino. San Bernardino. I, San Bernardino. Uh, I, uh, I inland. Yeah, inland. I, all right, cool. Um, so yeah, uh, they were up here with us last time. So I can honestly, and I don't know how many guys got picked up from All there. Most of All of them did? Except for about like two. So yeah, I mean, they're living proof also. Like, commit that to memory. Try and remember as much as possible. I mean, you never know what position you're going to be in. You could be the nozzle man, you could be the second man, or you could be, be a mule. Camper. Yeah, you could be anything. Engineer might have get sick or something. <laughs> uh, yeah, now the, now the next line has to be picking up. Yep. It is truly a win-win program as the wildland firefighting organizations benefit from the high level of leadership and fitness standards that veterans bring to the table, while veterans are exposed to jobs and career opportunities with a wide array of fire organizations. Way to pick up hose out on the line and drain it at the same time. It's called a butterfly. And this way we can grab it and we can put it back up on the engine and it's actually easily to be deployed again if we had to in an emergency. Yeah. But yet it's 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 compacted up for us. That's great. And it takes a lot faster than having to try to roll a yeah. whole roll by your hand. Yeah, I guess you've got to always be prepared, huh? Mm-hmm. And then like that, if you can see, we have one of those on the back of our engine, we have a hose on the back of the engine. Yeah. That's that's already been butterflied. Uh -huh. So if we had to go to somewhere else, we could put that up on that on that uh, pole that comes off the back there of the engine there and we can go drive to the next house to the next spot fire to whatever we need and be ready to and jump off and go the next one. Ah. You're good to go. any questions anything at all i know i know everybody wants to run the nozzle and everything like that we just don't really have the time <laughs> yeah, yeah. or the water <laughs> so actually i guess we do start to get into a little bit of more hose work up front this is where you have your mobile attack so you come up on a fire, and it's just a nice little thing, and it's stretched out a little bit of ways. This is your mobile attack. What you do with this, you pull the hose all the way out, charge up the hose with water, you're all the way out, and you start walking. And the, the engine's right behind you. They're driving, they're running the pump and everything like that, and you're walking, fighting the fire. you got another guy with you, up front with you, to kind of spot out, see what's going on, because your focus is on the fire and controlling the hose, the nozzle water pressure. The, uh, that, if you're fighting fire with an inch and a half versus an inch nozzle, inch and a half has more water, right? It's bigger, sprays out more water. So there's a little bit of a benefit and a little bit of a, of a negative there. The benefit is you have more water on the ground to go, to go out. The negative of that is 
you might use more water out of your engine if you're not very careful on on what there is because that engine only holds 500 gallons of water hmm. once it's 500 gallons of water is done then you're having to send that engine back to go refill or get somewhere have, have somebody come refill you from a water tender or something like that to be able to get water so the conservation might is it, water conservation is a pretty good key on on either one of these packs you got a few different compartments Obviously this job is not glorious, nor in any way comfortable for those who risk their lives to keep the rest of us and our land safe. Thanks to all the people who cooperated in this story, and a special thank you to our wonderful firefighters. Now, our weekly neighborhood beat with our own Paula Johnston. Hi, this is Paula Johnston with Auburn News 20, and sitting next to me is Gwen Jones. And Gwen is the uh, owner and instructor of yoga at Auburn Yoga Fitness. But today I found her at the, is it Ashford Park, Gwen? Ashford Park in Auburn, on Ash Auburn Ravine Road. Okay. Ashford Park. So, so tell me what's happening here. Is this a regular thing? We do this every summer. We are having yoga in the park. It's a gentle yoga class from July all the way through September 30th. Mm. So, um... We have enjoyed this park for five years, and this is our fifth summer, and we're very happy. Initially, this yoga class was the idea of two of my students who take on Monday morning, and um, they wanted yoga in the park, and we kind of laughed and whatnot, and they wanted to go out in the parking lot, and we made jokes, and <laughs> should we go out in Fiddler Green, or should we go out here or there, or whatever, and actually, we discovered that we can do this. And we started it, and it's been very successful ever since. And uh, it's really, I, I thank them for that for it. It's what a great cool. idea! Somebody had a wonderful idea, and I just uh, partook of a, of a s slight amount of yoga, and it was just beautiful. The breeze is gorgeous, and yeah. we're right by this lovely pond. And I noticed even the ducks were getting into it. <laughs> the ducks do. The ducks and the little swans. Once in a while, they're they're used to people, and they come by and they visit us once in a while. And it's just, it's so peaceful and so beautiful and uh, at, there are parts of Ashford Park uh, near the parking lot for example where we occasionally will do our yoga class where um, the genre is slightly different we might hear a little more noise from the street or something and we decide sometimes to move over here if the lawn is dry enough which it was today and we are near the pond it's beautiful the ducks visit and behind us we have the doggy park couldn't which be better. That's perfect. Ashford Park is famous for the doggy park and it's very very popular people come here early in the morning mm -hmm. they park and they spend their time here and they usually leave by 11 or 12 before the heat you know gets to the puppies and whatnot and it's it's absolutely beautiful we hear birds we hear dogs we see the clouds moving overhead the sun is coming in and and we're just uh, enjoying the sun and saluting and it's great very rejuvenating and I noticed there's a uh, children's playground do people ever show up with their children and have them play on the toys or do people generally leave their children home uh, generally children are left home they're not actually allowed to attend class however we have had several people attend class and we can watch the children as the uh, class uh, through the class's entirety mm. so uh, we can watch the children right here at the park and they're playing on the swings and the monkey bars or whatever they're called I can't really remember it's been so long mm. and they enjoy it very very much so we can be in view of everything and the children do not leave the park so that's very nice okay and do you welcome that or do you prefer people not um, as long as uh, I can assist, uh, sometimes I will watch the children, but if, if, if your, your focus should be on your yoga practice yeah. and you want to be able to focus and not be stressed. We want all the focus, all the breath directly into the yoga practice so that you can be 
uh, com completely 100% concentrating. So that's really the best way. Just once in a while, someone would will bring yeah. a child if they have no choice. Okay, well that's nice. And it seems like, yes, yoga is something that you sort of want to take that time for yourself. So it'd be kind of nice if you if you don't have to focus on your children, but there is that option if necessary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's you, lovely. You want to focus on yourself. That's what yoga is about. We focus on our body. We focus on our mind. We focus on our breathing. Yeah. And it just with that progressive practice, it just all gels, and you you are. It is your own time. It is your own special time of growth and rejuvenation really in the body and mind so it's it's just terrific we love it mm, it is very special very important time i've learned that good morning ladies good morning what's your name ellen ellen yes have you been coming to this yoga in the park very long nope this is only my second time oh really yeah and what do you think of it it's very relaxing and just very peaceful I noticed even the ducks were relaxing here next to you. Yes, they're very friendly. <laughs> Seems like the atmosphere must be sort of uh, spreading. And are you a regular yoga practitioner? I've done a lot at home by myself, but it's much better with the instructor. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you on that because she can kind of guide you and let you know where the body parts are going the wrong direction, things like that. Exactly, yeah. It, it really makes a huge difference having somebody tell you. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. What's your name? My name is Elisa. I've never done yoga outside before. Oh, really? And it's like, it's this wonderful, uh, I can feel the breeze. You know, you can feel the breeze too. Yes. Yeah. The breeze does feel lovely. In what way do you find yoga helpful? Using my muscles consciously and stretching things that don't usually stretch. And how do you usually feel afterwards? Um... I was, um, last week was my first time, so I was tired and boy did I sleep, I'll tell you. Oh, well, that's a, be a benefit, isn't it? Your body when, in ways that you never think to use your body. Which days are you here? We are here every Monday morning at 9.30, so this is a gentle yoga class. Uh, only on Monday mornings at 9.30 here in Ashford Park. So uh, we have other classes in the studio, but this class is through Auburn Recreation District. Mm -hmm. So um, the attendees go to the Auburn Rec District or they go online and they can sign up for this class, whatever's more convenient for them. Okay, and that would be www.auburn rec.com okay. auburnrec.com okay we will have that website address on the screen so oh, thank you very much oh, so people just need to go to that check out the times and, and the location and sign up can they sign up online they can sign up online for the monthly they can sign up for example for the rest of July or August or September or if they're going on vacation and that's not convenient for them and they feel they may be missing classes uh, you can uh, buy a five punch pass. Okay, and how expensive is it? Is it expensive? The five punch pass is $10 a class. It's $50, and the monthly sign-up, I believe, is $40 for residents and $45 for non-residents. Oh, that's very good. That's a very good price. It's quite affordable, yeah. We're happy with that, yes. Well, very nice. Well, thank you, Gwen. I appreciate you talking to us, and it was very nice to be here. Thank you so much, Paula. Flexion point flex. Yes. Now bring your ankle through. Colfax, which is a sleepy little railroad town just 18 miles from Auburn, is the home of Rollins Lake. It's a popular spot for the locals who try to beat the heat. This past weekend, the Placer Ultimate Brewing Society met at the beautiful Green Acres Campground for their first annual Brewmakers Brew Ha Ha, or is it Brew Ha Ha? The Auburn News 20 cameras were there, found this jolly band of brothers quietly enjoying their home brewed beer. It was too much to resist on a day when the temperatures were above 103, even in the Sierra. Paula Johnson sampled some of the delicious brews. She also learned a few things about home brewing. Here's her beer report. Hi, this
This is Paula Johnston with Auburn News 20. And today I'm up in Colfax at the Rollins Lake Reservoir. Is it a reservoir that's here? You know, I've heard there's a reservoir. We have not found it yet. We did take the kayak out this morning and... <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, there's somewhere. Anyhow, I was walk going through this field and I happened to notice a sign that says pubs. And so I was very curious about that. And with me here now is Cynthia, what's it, Cynthia? Cynthia Lee. Cynthia Lee, and she is going to tell us all about what's going on here with the Plaza Ultimate Brewing Society. So, Cynthia, tell Indeed, us what's happening. Indeed, we are the Plaster's Ultimate Brewing Society. We are a group of home brewers from the area. Um, and we've all come up here to, A, get away from the heat, but also as a family come together and talk about our beers and uh, be able to get up in nature and, and enjoy some, some brews and some sun and uh, have a good time together. So we're up here at Rollins enjoying and uh, it's actually a pretty fun thing. We'd like to show you around. And is this an annual event or is uh, it just is a... our first event? We're a brand new club about a year old and uh, have a variety of brewers uh, myself being one of them and um, a little something different from everybody, which is really great. So if somebody wanted to join the brew club, they would just go to your website? Absolutely, absolutely. We have uh, from newbies on up through uh, Grandmaster Beer Judges, which is really exciting. So there's something for everybody, which is great. Yeah. And which areas do you cover? Uh, we have, uh, based out of Roseville, but we have people from Placerville, uh, gosh, just about all the surrounding areas. Everybody's welcome. So there's uh, a, a home for everyone. and. They can join us anytime. And do you brew beer yourself? <laughs> I do, actually, yes. I'm, I'm one of those people that likes to put a lot of interesting things in our beer. Um, one of my favorites is a hibiscus passion fruit wheat. Oh, that um, sounds really nice. Coming from England, you know, I do like things in my <laughs> beer, too. I generally like lime juice or, or black currant juice or something like that. But hibiscus, Delicious. that sounds wonderful. Very exotic and great in the heat. <laughs> yeah. And do we get to taste some of that? Absolutely, we do. Oh, I, I landed in a good spot right here. Well, shall we go on in and uh, see what else you've got going on? Come right this way. Right. Join us. Thank you. So now we're in the beer tent. Yeah. We are. Absolutely. We have an assortment of uh, brewers and beers, which is very exciting. Um, so we'll kind of give you an idea. of One of the ones I was telling you about is a hibiscus wheat. This is an imperial, um, and it does have passion fruit. And what do you mean when you say an imperial? Imperial means that it's, it's a very high, uh, higher alcohol beer, a little bit higher maltiness. Um, and sweetness, oh, I um, like so sweetness. it's a little bit different. You can really get the head on the um, hibiscus and the passion fruit in there. It smells lovely. Now, I'm I'm a wine drinker, and when you're a wine drinker, you know you do the you know, absolutely, and all absolutely. That. Do you do we the do same as well. Beer? Yes, well, we that sure makes, do. Makes complete sense. <laughs> so here we go. I'll give it the ultimate taste test. Absolutely. Very nice. <laughs> oh, that's really good. Thank you. Did you <laughs> brew that? It. Yes. And we have a, a variety of other types of beers. Some of them are a little bit more hoppy. This one is is less hoppy. Hops was used originally oh as a preservative. So. And is it in the? Is this an original? You, yeah. you, it's a recycled bottle. It is a recycled okay. bottle. We love these girls. They're tops. wonderful <laughs> bottles, aren't they? Yeah. The, those are great. It's delicious. How do you make that? Um, you actually make a, a, a brew or a wort uh, with grains and you uh, sift it through. Um, so what's wort? That's like the, the... It's like your witch's brew. Okay. It's a tea basically made of grains. Okay. Um, and we go ahead and strain that through, boil it down, add some yeast to it and allow it to ferment. That's what gives it the alcohol. It does a conversion. And then you can uh, carbonate it and chill it down. And mm. it's, it's a process. Some beers uh, can be done in four to six weeks. Some of them take months. Really? How long have you been doing this? Uh, about four years. Really? Yes. Wow, you're good. Thank you. It's natural. <laughs> it's a, lot, a learning process. Uh, there's, there's some good things and some bad things that happen. And yeah. hopefully you learn from the bad ones and take on with the good ones. Mm -hmm. so. so I see you've got a group of merry men around here. We do. This is our group of brewers. And they also have a couple of beers that they would love to share with you as well. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to finish this one and then move on to the next Sounds one. Lovely. I hate wasting things. <laughs> Hi, so you're Rick. I'm Rick. Hi, Rick. I'm Paula. Hi, nice to meet you. Thank you. Nice to meet you, too. And you're a brewmaster? Is that what you call, you're called? We're, well, we're not brewmasters quite yet. Uh, so What well, qualifies you as a brewmaster? I, I believe you got to go to school oh, really? to, to be certified, yes. School of yeah. life or school of hard school knocks? Of brewing. School of, oh, special school? S special school. Oh, 
take a lot of tests. <laughs> you could become a brewmaster, I guess, without going to school if you get qualified enough to brew at a brewery. Yeah. I would think a test would be, try this, and how is it? That'd be the easy way. That'd be nice. That would work, huh? Yeah. So how long have you been brewing beer? I've been about four and a half years. Uh, so same as, um, same as Cynthia. Cynthia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you two are hooked up. Yes, we're married. Okay. <laughs> so we do it all the time. Do you plan to start a business in this at all? Not right now. No, it's just a hobby. Just a hobby. And tell me what's happening here. We're just having a great time all hanging out together as a brew club, and we've invited other brew clubs to come as well. So we're going to do campfire singing tonight, and we've just been hanging out all day enjoying the lake. Get in some beer in there to make the to, to grease up the vocal cords. Yes, lots of homebrew. So yeah, it's been a good time. Well, thank you. It's carbonated well, yes. Uh -huh. I'm having way too much fun well, here. That's what we do here. We have fun. Cheers. But I'm supposed to be working. Oh, we are working, right? You're right, so right. Fun, yeah. Yep, the elbow's getting more and more tired as I work this hard. <laughs> uh, so what's your name? My name is Jason Williamson. Everybody calls me J-Dub. 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 Okay, did I get the accent right and everything? <laughs> <laughs> do I have an accent? <laughs> no. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. So tell me about this beer. Uh, this is a German style Kolsch uh, that I brewed some time ago. It should be a, a very light, uh, refreshing beer. And, and mm. um, uh, they uh, Kolsch is traditionally brewed in Cologne, Germany. And I, I'm not sure you can even call it a true Kolsch unless it is. And so can you say that name slowly? Kolsch. K? I think it's K-O-L-S-C-H. Is it Kolsch, Kolsch. guys? Yeah, okay. yeah, Kolsch, yeah. And it means... Good beer, I guess. Oh, yeah. I, agree. I agree with that. That's, that's true. Yeah. yeah. So. <clears throat> and how long have you been in this business? Uh, <laughs> I've been brewing for just over two years. Yeah. yeah. My uh, my wife bought me uh, one of those little Mr. Mister beers, right? I've, <laughs> I've always been interested in brewing, and I've always loved to drink good beer. Yeah. And so for Christmas or my birthday or something, one, one year she bought me this Mr. Beer. Well, it sat around and, and I never used it or anything like that. And so we were cleaning the garage one day and she found it. She's like, you see, I bought you this and you never did. And so I was like, okay, that's it. And so I went inside from cleaning the garage and I brewed my first beer and I've never looked back. And it's gone way far beyond uh, the, the little Mr. Beer kid. <laughs> and, and is your wife glad she got it for you or is she having second thoughts? I don't know. You'd have to ask her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's actually here too. <laughs> Somewhere. Polishing the new brewing equipment. Honey, <laughs> I'm home. Yeah. So um, this is an annual event I hear, or is going to hopefully going to be. Yeah, yeah. This is a, a annual event for us, uh, the first annual here for us uh, this year. But uh, you know, it's it's been great uh, uh, being uh, with this group of people. Uh, you know, being a brewer, you know, you're kind of always looking for, you're looking for advice and, you know, there's tons of books and there's tons of literature, but, you know, as you brew, you, you really, you, you, you need to talk to other people who are interested in the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's been great for me to be able to talk to people like Dave Long and, and Rick and, 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 and these people who've been brewing longer than I have and, 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 you know, lean on that, their expertise. And you know what, in the process, we, we've made some great friendships too. And yeah, so, that's yeah, nice. yeah. That's a that's a very very good reason for brewing beer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, beer saved As the if world, you need right? One. Yeah, right. <laughs> As if save water, drink beer. Yeah, right. Yeah, they say they say beer saved the world. So yeah. there it is. Yeah. Oh, it's a great thing. Yeah, this is this is our good friend Dave Long right here. Hey, I'm Hi, Dave a, Long. Uh, Hi, BJCP judge. What's uh, that? That's a uh, beer judge certification. Cert it's called beer judge certification program. Okay. So you can actually go through and get tested to be a judge really? in beer. So I've gone through that program and I've taken a test. And what kind of uh, skills do you have to have to qualify as a BJCC? Uh, <laughs> right? Beer judge certification program. There you, go. <laughs> um, you just need to be familiar with the styles of beer. You know, beer is brewed all across the world, so there's different styles of beer, and mm -hmm. you know, depending on the environment that that the bears brewed in, you know, that's how those styles are developed. And so you need to be familiar with the styles of beer, okay, because you're judging all the styles, mm -hmm. you know, from one time or another. And right now in that program, there's over 83 styles of beer. Wow. And they're very different, unique styles. So you need to be very familiar. And if you move into, say, Brewers Association, there's well over 100. It's like 140 different styles of beer. Gosh, I would never have had any idea. I think I know maybe three. Lager, <laughs> pale ale, and dark beer. Well, what there else you is go. <laughs> well, lager really isn't a style. It's just it's how. Well, it is a style, but at, alone it's not a style. There's many lagers in Pilsner's. Oh, oh so, I see. Yeah, I see. Yeah. And so if you were to make beer that was mm -hmm. 
um, that the materials for were grown in this area. What style beer would be, uh, you know, a really good beer that you could grow here? Um, well, it's, I mean, you could probably move into um, American Ales. It'd be very good because the hops, as Mark was talking about early, the type of hops that grow here mm -hmm. are, um, they're very citrus. They call sea hops. You know, they've got Cascade, um, Centennial, um, Chinook, Columbus. Um, they have a characteristic that's, uh, they're bitter and they've got a kind of almost a grapefruit citrusy oh. uh, flavor to them. And so those type beers um, would do very well. And as a matter of fact, you hear a lot about uh, West Coast IPAs. I have heard that term. So mm. those are the very hoppy, citrusy beers that you hear about. So those hops are actually, uh, excuse me, growing up in uh, like Yakima Valley, um, up in Oregon and uh, southern Washington. So that's, that's, that's a, a prime They area like a lot of all. moisture? Um, not necessarily moisture. As a matter of fact, the areas that they're really growing are dry and acrid, oh, really? believe it or not. But they like water. Mm -hmm. They need water to grow. I see. So, mm -hmm. But a lot of sunlight. Mm -hmm. So, then, then the hops. So I'd say probably the IPAs, uh, American Pale Ales. Okay. And do you brew beer yourself? Oh yeah. And what kind? What style do you make? Um, I try to tap into a lot of different styles. Um, right now, I brought up a Pale Ale, American Pale Ale, and a Belgian Golden Strong. And see, I'm a lazy type person. These guys <laughs> all brought up bottles, and I, that's too much work. So I just brought up kegs. Oh, you so really instead of cleaning, guy. you know, 40, 50 bottles, I get to clean two. Oh, so. that's smart. Yeah. <laughs> and this, this is really bad. My kegerator is right over there. It's plugged in. This is really <laughs> tough camping. So. Is this the voice of experience? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> it was kind of a last minute decision to bring uh, up the kegerator. I'm uh, sure they would have brought up kegs too. Uh, yeah. So. Well, this is mm -hmm. this is a fledgling sort of thing, and I imagine yeah. it's going to grow to be quite a, a successful event. I'm, I'm really hoping. I mean, the location is perfect up here. It's for absolutely it. yeah. beautiful. I've never seen such a lovely spot. It is. It's a great spot, and it it kind of, in a way, it kind of grew out of. I was with Cynthia last year and Rick, and we were all up at the Northern California Homebrewers mm -hmm. uh, Festival in CHF, and it's up in Dobbins, which is. Oh, yeah kind of I guess it's east of Marysville up right, in the hills right. yeah. and it's basically two to three thousand homebrewers this converge and take over this campground wow. and it's just a great event um, the clubs there's a lot of other homebrew clubs like pubs here um, and they bring in and set up a, a, a you know a display of their beers and they actually serve their beers there and share it with the other homebrew I had groups. no idea yeah. that beer brewing was such a, a big thing oh it's huge uh, there's uh, you know, I don't know the numbers and everything, but yeah. there's a huge number of homebrewers in the United States or across the world. Oh, very yeah. interesting. Oh, yeah. And and it's just a stroke of luck that I happen to be here today. And I am just really impressed with this um, lovely breeze that's here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Where I'm, where <laughs> I have been, and where I'm going back to going to is the Western States 100 Mile Endurance Run. Have oh. you heard about that? Yeah, and that was was. That was today? That's today. They're yeah. Right I've now. Gone. That's crazy. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> no. I, I know where I would rather be. <laughs> and, they, and they just issued a hot temperature weather warning today. Yeah. And I'm going, I feel sorry for those runners. I and, well, I bet you they're, they're going to want some of our beer at the end yeah, of that race. Say, you guys need to be down at Plaza High School. And maybe emptying your kegerators. <laughs> uh, yeah. And actually, I was reading a local magazine, and there's a lot of runners out there that they actually use brew or beer, homebrew or commercial beer, uh, to rejuvenate. Because it's, it is loaded with vitamins. Well, that's right. That's a yeah. good thing to bring up. Mm -hmm. So tell me about the uh, the nutritional components of beer. I can't tell you everything about it because well, I don't tell know. Me what you but, know. you know, there's a lot of vitamin B I'll in it. I'll just have to have some vitamin so. B. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. I and can it's taste got, the vitamin B. You know, the yeast and there's other vitamins in there. Um, I mean, they're natural ingredients. You know, mm -hmm. they've got, you know, basically, you got your malts that go in there, and that's made from barley. Mm. Okay, so in, you got wheat, yeah. your hops is natural, and that has antiseptic qualities and the medicinal type qualities in it. Um, the yeast is loaded, packed with vitamins. You know, I, yeah, well, it's, it's no delicious. Doctor, so. it, it, it's, it would be hard not to drink more. It's really yes, tasty. Yes. I, ha I, didn't re I don't drink very much beer nowadays anymore. Mm -hmm. I drink more wine, but 
I think I might change my ways. Well, there's a bunch of different styles out there, yeah. and they're all fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Oh, I really appreciate the education. So now we have two different beers to taste, and are these your beers? These are Dave Long's beers. Uh -huh. These are the beers that were in the kegs. Okay, but you're going to talk about them. You're going to tell me about them. Uh, you know, I'm one of the newest members here, okay. but I can tell you I just brewed a Belgian, strong, uh, Belgian beer, and I'm learning quite a bit about them. But, okay, well uh, tell me about a Belgian beer. What's its characteristics? This is a test to see if you can pass the PGCB, whatever it was. No, for, for, the, for those true details, you need to talk to a person like Dave. Uh, but I do know that it is primarily the yeast that makes this a Belgian. You okay. use Belgian yeasts. The uh, focus is on maltiness, not on hoppiness. So you're not gonna get the hoppiness that you get with the IPAs and the pale ales the Pacific kind of beers. Mm. Oh, I like that. You're going to get a little bit of sweetness. Mm. Um, you must have a sweet tooth. You get a lot of alcohol. Oh. This is this is a Belgian strong, so 8, Does 9, 10%. that to 10%. one the car? <laughs> yeah. And actually, Dave helped me brew a Belgian blonde, which is a kinder, gentler version of this Belgian strong. Mm -hmm. It's about half the alcohol. It's It uses half the amount of grain. Um, but... It's, it was in that process that he started me down the slippery slope of brewing. Oh, because I used, to, I used to brew about 10 years ago, and then I stopped, and then you brew once or twice, and it's like, oh, this is good. I like this. This is fun. And then you have to start buying pieces of equipment, and yeah. you buy one piece, and then pretty soon you have everything you need to actually brew on your own, and then you need to learn from all the people that have been doing it for a while. It sounds like a really fun pastime, a fun way to spend your spare time. It is. And it's, a lot, it's a lot of fun, and in the end, you wind up with beer. Can't Probably beat be that. Yeah, yeah, really. That's a very great uh, bonus at the end. And this one is a... That's a pale ale, so now that's going to have more of the hoppiness. You're going to taste the hops really, a lot stronger. Oh, that's delicious, too. It's different. It's drier. Mm. It's not as sweet. They're both really delicious, but they're both very different. And I think that's one of the things that makes mm. beer interesting is the fact that there are so many different kinds and you don't appreciate how distinct they are. It's like wine. You mm. say, well, you know, you got red and you got white. No, 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 no. There's a lot of, you know, nuances. In nuances. In and the, I in wonder if different people taste different things because, Dave, am I supposed to get any banana flavor in this one? You bet. That's mm. Actually, one of the things that are happening now is food pairing. Oh, food pairing. Because, uh, you know, f forever, wine and food have been paired. Mm -hmm. Okay. But now the, a lot of gourmet chefs are realizing that the complexity of beer, there's so many different flavors in it that they're really finding that beer pairs wonderfully with different styles of food. Yeah. So that's something that's, you know, that's up that's and new, coming yeah. that you're going to hear more idea. of. Yeah. Mm. As a matter of fact, we have a nationally ranked judge within our group that actually does that as part of his business. Oh. He goes out and pairs food with uh, different styles of beer. I might so. have to come back. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have yet to go to one of Big Mike's, uh, you know, dinners, but you know, I hear I've had some sampling of different type cheeses and things that we've put together with beer and it's there, that's wonderful. <laughs> this is just amazing. Yes. I just can't believe I got this lucky to bump into you guys yeah. here today when I should have been out sweating on the trail somewhere. This is, <laughs> this is so much more fun. I've cooked, oh, I've got a, a barley wine, which is a, a, a type of really very strong beer. And what beer would you cook sweet. with that? Or what would um, you cook in I actually beer? made a, um, got him this blank in it. Uh, uh, it was a prime rib basting, and I actually, but it wasn't when you put Marinade. Make, marinade, that's it. So I actually marinated the uh, barley wine and do this. You made a marinade out of barley wine and put this prime rib. What else would go in the marinade? Other than the barley what else wine? does it need? I mean, it's got <laughs> everything. So no, but it, the, I mean, I, it's been a long time, so I've only done it yeah. once or twice, but it's wonderful. Um, oh. I've made a brown ale uh, gumbo. Oh. Made in that part of the roux was actually the brown ale. And there's some other dishes I've made, but it's leaving me right now. <laughs> well, this is just wonderful. It opens up so yeah. many possibilities, and this is a whole new field of, of interest that I've never heard of it before. So it's really wonderful to learn yeah. about it. 
So, Jeff, what have you got here? Well, I, you were talking to Dave Long about food and uh, beer pairing, and this happens to be an article in the latest uh, Hops to Table magazine. What's this? Where do you get this? Um, it's actually a free publication that's available in places where you buy beer well, supplies and, and, and but and as far as beer. the food and beer pairing this is one an article by Mike Moore and it talked about how he selected the beers to have with his uh, you know chicken fennel and tomato bruschetta crostini why would you pick a specific beer to have with that and he describes his reasoning behind the characteristics of the beer that he selected and the characteristics of the food and why they go together. Is there a short example that you could give us? Um, well, it says, it ta okay, so for the one I just talked about, the um, crostini, mm -hmm. uh, it says, think of the two main food items to match here, the fennel and the tomato. And then he discusses how the fennel is a savory spice and it goes with certain kinds of hops mm -hmm. and that the, um, uh, the tomato is meaty and, and has, a, has a substance to it that speaks to a malt and he describes the kind of hop that he selected and the kind of malt that he selected and the beer that contains those. So it's, a, it's almost like a science just as viticulture and, and food and wine pairing. They, exactly. Yeah. It's, there's a logic to it. Yeah. That you choose what the characteristics of the food are and what the characteristics of the beer should be that go with it. This really um, brings more sophistication to beer than, than I think most people would expect. Well, people have been doing food and wine pairing yeah. forever. Yeah. And this is really no different. It's right. just that it's using the characteristics of a beer, which are primarily the malt and the hops, yeah. um, to go with the characteristics of the food. Well, cheers to that. Thank <laughs> well, thank you very much. And it's been such a wonderful event. Thank you for having us here. Really I am having more fun than I was 10 minutes ago because I've had a few more beers. This is really wonderful. I hope that I'll be able to come out here again. Please join us. So you're going to be doing this some more? Uh, yes, we will definitely have uh, an annual event up here, which will be great. Hopefully it'll grow and evolve into a really wonderful thing. If people are interested in learning to brew, they can definitely get a hold of us at plasterbrewers.org. Uh, we do meet at the Owl Club in Old Roseville. Uh, which um, club? The Owl Club. It's oh, a historical uh, building in Old Roseville. Oh, and yes. they have graciously allowed us to come up and have our meetings there the third Thursday of every month. Okay. So if you're interested about learning um, how beer is made, and what to do, they feel free to look us up online or come to visit us in person. And you're welcome back anytime. Oh, thank you very Cheers. much. Cheers. <laughs>